you, the use of calculators on the range, I can remember, you know, laying on, on a Marine Corps range and the kid has his data book out and his uh, calculator sitting there on top of it. And he would, he would go, all right, 700, and he'd do his little math formula, and I'd be like, all right, you know, if that was a deer, that sucker was gone. Welcome back to Whiskey and Windage, the 2A podcast for the people, by the people. I'm your host, Mike, and I'm joined by my co-hosts, Adam and Matt. Matt, how's it going today, man? I'm doing really good, brother. It's a beautiful Sunday. Made it out to the range today. A little hot, but uh, chilling with my boys. Excited for a great talk. Yeah, man, we've got a, uh, we've got, man, we've got the great Todd Hodnett from Accuracy First and He's going to talk to us about long range shooting and um, his background and everything that he and his son are doing with accuracy first. Um, Adam, man, how's your weekend going, bro? Man, my week is great. I mean, I know, Matt, you said it's hot there, but uh, I think we got you beat in San Antonio. It's a, it's, a, it's a scorcher over here, but I'm loving it. But uh, I'm excited, too, because long range is something I want to get into. The longest mm. I've ever actually shot myself, I will say, is 1,000 yards. I've never <laughs> been past 1,000 yards. When you get past 500 yards, I feel like I don't know what I'm doing. So getting some insights, some knowledge will be great. Yeah. Hey. I mean, Matt probably shot 1,000 yards, 1,500 yards, and that's just because he missed the berm and he's in Idaho and it just kept going. But, <laughs> it just kept on going. Yeah, yeah. It, yeah it did. But, uh, man, it looks like uh, it looks like Todd's about to load it in. It is so, loading in. Yeah. So, boys, let's go ahead and check him out. Let's, let's go. go, dude. We interrupt our program to bring you this important message. All right, everybody, we want to put our hands together. Welcome to the show, a legend in the industry, Mr. Todd Hodnett from Accuracy First. Todd, we want to thank you very much for joining us. Uh, thanks for having me. Awesome, dude. Welcome welcome to the show, man. We're excited to have you on. Yeah, it's, uh, it's no secret, like I said earlier before we started, it's no secret why we wanted you on the show, mm. and uh, that's long-range shooting. And talking with some friends who have done some training with you. Um, everyone was like, Hey, I can't think of a better instructor. So I guess to start, give a little backstory on what got you into firearms. Were you a, were you a hunter? Uh, yeah. So basically grew up country boy, uh, way out in the middle of the country. Uh, we, our, my parents farmed at that time and we were beside a ranch and that ranch had a prairie dog town that wrapped about three quarters of the way around the house. Yes. So I actually grew up shooting prairie dogs uh, from the time I was, you know, shooting at 22, probably six years old, uh, maybe five, something you go to prison for, at least your parents would today. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But, you know, basically uh, they taught me good farm safety and uh, then would kind of turn me loose and, you know, the first little bit, it was with a pellet rifle, and I was gone. Uh, I, at that time, I lived 18 miles out in the country. Uh, nearest neighbor was probably, to be honest, probably close to uh, eight miles away. So, I mean, wow. mom and dad would turn me loose, and I'd, I'd romp around the ranch and farm and uh, shoot whatever I could shoot with a pellet rifle, and then that grew into 22s and shooting prairie dogs. And uh, then obviously it was like, well, how far away can you hit one? And then that turned into yeah. 22, 22, 250s and in, in hunting. So moved into a very, you know, important, uh, part of my youth and growing up was, you know, going out and hunting. We didn't have deer or, or antelope or anything like that. So it was kind of, and yeah. a lot of, yeah, yes. a lot of, a lot of bird hunting. So, you know, we did dove, quail, all that kind of stuff, uh, a few duck, a few geese, that kind of deal. And then, but mainly, uh, started getting into more, I moved from the Leveland area outside of Lubbock up to Dalhart, and we, we leased a big ranch up there and ended up buying a farm in the middle of it. Well, that turned into coyote hunting for real because it's 30,000 acres. Uh, oh. And then we, I had a neighbor that had 60,000 acres, and I was the only guy who could hunt his property. And so we had mule deer, we had antelope, we had some whitetail. Uh, and so it, it was a, a mecca for a young kid, 20 years old, just to be turned loose on, you know, over a hundred thousand acres. So 
We have a lot of country to, to roam. And that's so, a tough life. Yeah. And, and that turned into, it, you know, my deal was I loved hunting so much that uh, I, I was a pilot back then. So I got my pilot's license when I was 18 because opening morning, uh, you know, 30 minutes before daybreak, I was sitting on top of the hill uh, in, in his country. And as soon as the sun came up, I'd look around, scan, find him, and take a shot. And uh, finally, I was driving around the edge of one of my circles, and I, I thought I saw him. So at the center of the pivot, which is 440 yards away, uh, this deer was grazing, and he had a lot of horns on him. So I thought, that's him. So I, I just jumped out over the hood of my pickup and shot, and he dropped dead. And I was like, that's not even fun. And th then it was kind of like, you know, I'm going to get into bow hunting. So I dropped my guns, except for coyotes, uh, and I bow hunted for seven years and never picked up my gun except for coyote hunting. So, so yeah, I very much hunting background. Some kid in the Rangers, uh, their parents shot cowboy action, and they said, hey, you need to take a class from Todd. So this kid called me up and said, hey, would you teach us you know, how to shoot pistol? I said, sure. So I go down to a facility and uh, working with the Rangers, and they said, hey, there's a sniper comp this weekend. Why don't you stay and shoot it with us? And I, I was like, man, I didn't bring a gun. And, and one of the guys said, uh, I got a spare you, Bart and I. So <laughs> this was the first time I saw a horse radical. So I stayed up till about 2 o'clock that morning trying to figure out the, the horse PDA, uh, so, the ballistic yeah, the ballistic I, program, and the radical. Say, I was going to say, Todd, I'm familiar with the horse, um, but for those that are not, familiar with it yeah um why don't you explain a little bit of it okay so basically dennis samet was the inventor of the horse reticle so he was uh he had no background kind of like me uh but he was sitting at a campfire in australia and he drew out in the sand a gridded reticle he was like you know we got this you know milled up system but why did why aren't there uh horizontal stadia lines below the crosshead and where we can actually do windage holes at distance. So he drew it out in the sand, came back home and patented it, and boom, we got a Christmas tree radical. So he was the first. Uh, and then I came in after I started, you know, working with him. Actually, I was shooting the competitions. Uh, the first one I think I finished sixth place in, uh, I, I was still trying to figure out a lot of stuff, how to make everything work together from that 2 o'clock in the morning. That was my only experience with it. Sniper's Challenge is in two weeks. If you want to sign up, you've got to sign up now. And so I asked a buddy that I just met. I said, hey, you want to sign up and go partners with me? And he said, yeah. And I asked this guy, I said, hey, you're going to be at the match. Can I borrow your rifle? I'm getting the hang of it. And I hated the horse rifle. Uh, the first time I looked at it, I was like, oh, my gosh. You know, I'm getting lost. What a mess. You know, yeah, it, it was horrible. I wanted my system uh, that I grew up on, which was basically meal dots and crossings. You know, so. Yeah. But I noticed that that first event, you know, I'd be sitting there and, and they would uh, turn off the light. So you'd see a target 700 meters away and they'd give you five seconds to look at it and they'd turn the light on. And then you had to go in without any light and dial your dope on for 700 meters and you could hear these people clicking. Well, I, I knew 700 meters. I knew what my dope was. And I was like, I'm not dialing anything. I'm just going to do a hole. Well, you'd hear one person going, you know, 23, 24, 25, and then the guy beside is going six, seven, eight, and then it gets mixed up, and then they both have to dial all the way back down, start back up, and so on, moving from one target to the next, because you may shoot two different targets, and you may not have the time to dial down. Uh, so it, I started seeing some of the advantages, uh, especially not time shooting with the holdovers, uh, and then speed shoots. You know, there was a clear advantage, uh, you know, doing holdovers in speed shoots, which a lot of that time uh, back in the early 2000s in the sniper comps, a, a lot of it was built around speed, how many targets you could knock down in a minute and a half, and so at different distances. So we ended up going down that road, and I had won uh, about three of the competitions, uh, my second, third, and fourth, and Dennis Samet called me up, and he said, hey, he said, you're winning all these comps. Would you do a military demo for us? And I said, yeah. I said, I'm ranching and farming. Uh, I'd love to help out the military. Obviously, this is past 9-11. And I said, uh, yeah, where do you want me to go? And I, so he sent me to Quantico. And I go up to Quantico, and we go through this process. I carry my rifle up there. They won't let me shoot my rifle. 
So, you know, it's not safety certed for their range, Marine Corps stuff. And so I was like, all right, hey, you know, y'all asked us to come up here. Can I borrow your gun from you? Well, he was a little miffed, and he said, yeah, I'll go to the trailer, ask so-and-so, get you a gun. Well, it had a 20-minute uh, bias on the on the rail, is you know, regular M40. And so my rings had a 20-minute bias because I had a flat rail. So now I had 40 minutes of bias. Well, the scope that I was using didn't have that much come-ups. And I wasn't, I wasn't going to tell them that. They had already told me I wasn't safety certified, so I, I can't tell them I'm not zeroed. Uh, so I get the gun zeroed seven mils above the crosshair and run their whole course of fire. And so we, we go through that, and he says, hey, that was real good. He said, can you teach that Marine beside you how to do it? And I said, okay, now I've got to confess. He said, what do you mean? I said, I, I couldn't get zero, so I had to zero above the crossing to make this work. And he said, explain what you did. What? And, and, yeah, and, and I explained it to him, and he said, I'm more impressed that you could actually figure it out in that amount of time and run through the whole course without missing. Uh, he said, how long would it take yeah. to teach him? I, I said, give me 10 minutes. And so I sat there with the kid for 10 minutes, walking him through everything, and he ran through it just like I did. So uh, they were real impressed at the time. We go in, start training guys out, out there, and we go through a week of training, and the guys go, hey, uh, you haven't taught us anything about shooting. I said, no, I'm a cowboy. I'm standing in my lane. I said, you know, you asked me to show you the equipment. That's what I'm doing. And so they said, would you change anything about what we're sh- the way we're shooting? And I said, oh, yeah, I'd change a lot. And they said, <laughs> okay, put it on the board. So I made this huge list on the board of everything I thought they would get benefit out of if they changed what they were doing. And so they said, hey, we want to hire you for a month. And so I, I, I said, all right, so do I come out here? Do we go to my range? Whatever. And they said, no, uh, we've got a buddy that has a ranch uh, or a range, and we, we utilize it. We don't really utilize him for instruction. Uh, I, I, and I laughed at him. I said, yeah, good luck. And he, they said, what do you mean? I said, he's not going to want me on his range. And, and they said, oh, no, no, we know him. It, it, it's good. It, it'll, it'll work out. Well, they called me. 30 minutes later, and they go, how in the hell did you know what would go down? I said, dude, it's obvious. I said, he doesn't teach what I teach. He doesn't want you to see it. Uh, it it's messing with his cash cow. And they said, do you have anywhere we can go? Well, I had a buddy that had a, a cowboy action range up in Utah, which was an old uranium mine. And it, it's 60 miles outside of Blandon. It, it, it's the only privately owned land in the middle of this, you know, huge parcel of BLM land. Uh, but, but he had plenty of land for us to set up all our targetry. And we went out there and stayed a month uh, with, with that one. So that was that was awesome. Yeah. At home, seventh group was at my house, uh, ready to do training. And immediately uh, one of the tier units uh, popped in and drug me out to their facility and away we went. So that was 2004-ish. And then... I started redesigning the radicals. So I saw things that, that I wanted to change. Uh, and so we made the H58, H59 radicals, uh, which basically just gave me uh, more information in the radical. Uh, and I implemented the math inside the 58 and 59. So that was the major change. And I put half mil uh, horizontal dots in between the, the, the mill lines. And so I brought in my whiz wheel, set it down on the table, and I said, hey, I said, uh, look at this. And I showed him how it worked, and, and he said, all right. He said, that's a great idea. He said, why didn't you come to me? Why are you using the applied ballistics uh, uh, solver? And I said, because if I used yours, you'd own it in about 30 minutes. And he laughed, <laughs> and he said, yeah, you're probably right. I, I showed him my first trimmer design, uh, being Dennis Sam, the owner of course. And he got mad and, you know, he was like, you ruined this, you know, you killed everything we've worked on for the past 10 years. Uh, and this was only, I, mean, I think this is probably around uh, 2008 ish. Uh, and, and I said, no, nope, I'm going to give you half of it, but you're going to patent it in my name and I'm going to split the royalties with you. And he said, done, 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 call you off. So away we went and now we had, I think, trimmer, well, probably shouldn't say it. We, we got trimmer nine showing up here before too long. So, man, I got a question for you to talk about this because it that story is just a whirlwind because it was, you you know, you're you're very competitive. Obviously, you can you, the archery, the pistol, the long range um, and how everything fell in line with training the military. 
And um, I never served, but I have the utmost respect for all that have. But, mm-hmm. you know, Adam will attest to this as he's still active. You know, they're, a lot of these guys aren't the smartest. Uh, they're not the brightest crayons in the box. So my question for you is, you know, anytime someone talks long range, and I, I haven't taken one of your classes, but you lose most of the room the moment you start getting into math. Um, and I guess my question is, how, how were you able to, self-taught, how were you able to transfer that knowledge to these guys who, you know, I won't, I won't talk about their knowledge and their education, but me, I mean, I, I'm, I'm educated, but uh, not math isn't my strong suit. So, like, how are you able to impart that knowledge to someone like me? Well, so basically, uh, like I said, my farm or my background is in farming. So while you're farming, I, I was actually farming 42 miles out in the country. So you're doing math all the time. N- me and numbers kind of work a little bit. So uh, I can remember numbers. I can't remember people's names at all. And I, and I really try. <laughs> and I've tried. Fair. Every, That's fair. So, yeah. Fair. So, but if you tell me your VIN number, I can't forget your VIN number. So, you know, it, and it's, it's, it's kind of a, uh, a curse in one way, uh, but for, for what I ended up doing, it, it's been phenomenal. So, but what we, what I think, what I did different was since I didn't have the background uh, and, and I didn't go to college, so I, d- I didn't have the math skills, the formal math skills. I learned how to make math work for me. So uh, I would take basically easy, take the answer, and figure out how to do the math backwards uh, to find the, the missing number. So, and that's basically exactly what Truing does. Uh, so, what, what I noticed with the military, uh, I'd go in to train, and this was SF, SEALs, Marines, everybody. We'd go out and shoot duck for the first two days. And I'm bored to tears going like, all right, this is taking forever. Well, if a guy has to change anything, he's got to go back and regather his duck. So, it was like, yeah. oh, man, this is arduous. It's so... Uh, I, I was sitting there watching, and, and another thing was that uh, you, the use of calculators on the range. I can remember, you know, laying on, on a Marine Corps range, and the kid has his data book out and his uh, calculator sitting there on top of it, and he would he would go, all right, seven hundred, and he'd do his little math formula, and I'd be like, all right, you know, if that was a deer, that sucker was gone. Well, you know, and that, the Marine, the Marine had the crayons out too. He had his crayons out there. <laughs> His color in both. <laughs> yeah, so it, it was something. And honestly, uh, I, I, I give, I'll give the Marines a little credit. They were the first ones. So they had a constant that was constantly changing because they figured out the formula didn't work. So, you know, you do times 12 at 500, times 14 at 700. I've been be messing up the numbers. I didn't like it. So uh, I didn't try to remember that one. Uh, but you, they figured out it wasn't working. So some you know smart kid figured out hey we can we can flip some of these numbers around a little bit and get something closer than than what the book is telling us so uh i was sitting there watching that one day and i was like man there's got to be an easier way so i was headed out uh to pendleton from uh el paso driving from paris texas and about three o'clock in the morning i was playing with matt keep me awake and came up with a quick win formula so basically, all that was was your range is the starting number. So 500 is 0.5. You just have to figure out what mile an hour makes that happen. Changes with every ballistic combination. So if you're dealing with the 308, it's four mile an hour. So four mile an hour makes 500 equal 0.5. And so you start playing with the ballistic engine. It's like, okay, well, how about a 300 wind map? Well, seven, or I'm sorry, five mile an hour makes 500 equal 0.5. And so on and so on. So it's like quick formula. So if the wind's blowing 20 miles an hour and you're shooting a 300 wind mag, 500 is 0.5 times four because there's four uh, fives in 20. So it's easy, simple math. And everybody could do it into where they could break it down in their head. So do it a simple. A big draw for me for, from the guys was I broke math down to third grade level. And so I, I would say, yeah. and I was told them, I'd say, hey, this is third grade math, guys. You know, uh, how many fours are in 12? Three. Three times your range. What are you shooting? 400? 
400.4 times three is 1.2. Let's go. And they were like, oh my gosh, does that work? Mm. That POI was adopted by most foreign units because I would say, hey guys, we've already got this done. Kevin is in play. He will share it. So I would link them two up and Kevin would share it with the Brits, Norway, uh, Australians, JTF2 out of Canada. So it, it was a fast like Everybody kind of morphs it a little bit and turns it into what they need to see. Oh, uh, but that, that one little deal kind of changed the POIs across uh, nearly everywhere that we went. That's Todd. I have to say it's awesome. That's, that's awesome. Much, dude. No, that's amazing. And I'll say this. I know you kind of downplay the math, make it easy. But the hardest part about math is simplifying it down to that simplest solution. Like you understood it, but you found a way. So kudos to that. But um, I want to flip the script a little bit because I read some stuff on you that was really interesting today. Um, I know you like 300 Norma, but I also yeah. read something about if you could change all your ARs over, you would go to 260 LaRue, correct? Ooh. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, it's – you say 260 LaRue. I shoot LaRue's. But it's a 260 yeah. Remington. Yeah. Uh, gotcha. So, okay. it, that, it, the 260 – I was shooting the 260 way before the 6.5 Creed was really kind of on the market. So, and, and you got to look at them. Uh, apples, apples. Uh, and, and to be honest, guys, uh, I'll, I'll probably get in a little trouble here. But the, uh -oh. the 260 Remington was a fantastic cartridge that was made by a company that really did make super high quality ammo. So when Reming, Remington. At the time, brought, huh? Yeah, well, exactly. So when Remington came out uh, with their, I guess it was their uh, ASR. Is that right? right. MSR. It's yeah, MSR, sorry. right? So yeah. I, I can't remember. I've been involved in every one of the programs. Now they're all running together. So when when they came <laughs> out with the, with the MSR, uh, they brought it to my house. And, they, and it was, I think it was the number three rifle. They said, hey, what would it cost for us to bring our rifle out for you to test and tell us what we need to do? And I said, no, nah, it's free. Don't worry about it. And they said, no, really, we know what your going rate is. What would you charge us? And I said, I'm serious. It's free, but the rifle ain't going home. I was, I was kidding. <laughs> so I was teasing. Rifle them, and they said, ammo. Yeah. They, they said, done. And I was like, wow, okay, because it's supposed Sweet. to be like $15,000 rifle. So <laughs> and I, I, I've still got number three. And it, it, number one, number two, and number three, the, the guy running the program got number one. The, his second got number two, and I got number three. And they stayed out there for a week, and we worked on that gun. And it was a fantastic gun, except when they went into full production, they had a lot of problems. So, Todd, with that being said, uh, it's interesting because I mentioned you mentioned before that you would replace your M4 AR-15 style rifles with a 260. Personally, if it was up to you, money, politics out of the side, bureaucracy in the military, would that be the round you would actually pick if you were if you were the guy to be chosen? Would you put the 260 in the M4 style rifle for U.S. soldiers? Right, so, fun, you know, the fun, it, else. yeah, the, the problem with the 260, it, it won't fit in an M4 mag in the first place. So, right. uh, it, yeah, I, would, I wouldn't put it in an M4. Definitely, really I, I, yeah, I, I would put it in our AR-10 platform. Well, that's, but we need a battle rifle. I'll be honest, I think the M4 is a little under. We should have a full-size battle rifle, in my opinion. Yeah, and, and, and the, the, the 6 arc, I think, is what's going to do that. Everybody's going to move to the 6 arc. So it, it get, the six arc is not it's it's I I, I really hate uh, the ignorance and, and you got to understand when I say ignorance ignorance to me is when you're not exposed to information doesn't mean you're stupid uh, no it just means you know, you're not so, educated yeah yeah exactly so my deal is I I hate when we chase things for the wrong reasons uh, with the military because I'm involved with a lot of the programs uh, it's kind of like the three hundred blackout uh, to me. It, it that, that's a horrible round. It was made to replace the MP5. Uh, a great, it's a great platform for that, but it's a jump gun for long range. So it, it's I, I would yeah, I, I keep it I keep a 300 blackout at my front door to shoot gophers <laughs> that pop up in the yeah. front yard. That's it. Uh, what about eight? I, what hey Todd? What about eight six though? Uh, now I've never seen anybody that shot eight six at locks. So it recoils too much. So here's the deal. Who, who are you going to give an 8.6 to? So you give an 8.6s to young guys that don't have the higher level training that have to deal with a ton of recoil uh, shooting. What is it? They're running like 3,200 feet per second now plus. Uh, so they're, they've got a ton of recoil, and it, it's not 
from from all the boys coming to me and telling me what they tested it, it's not a super accurate round. They're not happy with it. Uh, so they're trying to shoot it fast enough to make it penetrate body armor. But basically, uh, it's it's not anything I would have ever went with. Uh, everybody that was in the know as we were going into that uh, all saw everything coming and hated it. Uh, unfortunately, sometimes at higher levels, things go down the road that, you know, they don't need to go down. So, you know, I, I would go to the sixth arc only because it's 308 ballistics, nearly identical, maybe even a little bit better, depending. Uh, but at that in a, in an M4 platform now gives everybody a, uh, an M4 weight weapon system mm -hmm. and size with 308 ballistics. I think everybody got to go down That's that road. So we've talked about it. I've heard you say both ways, and I, I, and I well, we've I've heard you say both things. We've talked about dope. We've talked about truing. Um, I know you're a you, you prefer truing, definitely. Um, over dope, um, yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, yeah, over dope, a hundred percent. But you know, I I struggle with it because I talk to guys, and they're like, oh man, yeah, truing, whatever. I mean, you know, if you're not shooting, you know, if you're not putting ten rounds you know, in your target, you know, to, to verify zero, like you don't have zero. And I'm like, well, I disagree with that. Um, you know, yeah. when, when you get your rifle, I guess I was going to say, let's just say we're just going to buy a, a Remington 700 off the shelf and we're just going to go get a, I don't know, uh, just any run of the mill one by eight. Uh, I won't even say it's got the Horus reticle on it. I mean, how, when Todd, when Todd gets one of those weapons and Todd's got to put a zero on it, how does Todd do it? Uh, to be honest, man, uh, I'm going to go out and get a good fast zero on my weapon system. Uh, I'm going to have quality, info, you know, ammo, and uh, lay down at a no distance. And this is one of those deals, you know, when you zero, and I've seen guys and at my range where, you know, I would have them all zero at 100 meters, and then I'd go like, hey, guys, I need you to do, do me a favor. I want you to walk up to 100 yards. Uh, it's nine steps forward. And re-zero your guns because I've got a law enforcement range that I need to kind of run through and check. It's in yards instead of meters. And so I need you to re-zero your gun at 100 yards. And you're like, dude, we just took two hours to do this. And I'm like, do me a favor. Just go up there and shoot a group and adjust your scopes. So everybody goes up and lays down and shoots a group. And they get up and they go, Todd, there's no difference. And I said, yeah, and I ain't got a 100-yard range or a 100-meter range anywhere so i said i don't have a range, range set up in yards so i said the deal is everybody thinks i've seen so many guys lay down and pull out a laser range finder at 100 meters and move back two steps or a step and a half and lay down and shoot you cannot see the difference your gun zero to so zero because and then i would make them re-zero before they left and then as soon as they got home they were supposed to go and check zero because i was trying to change the establishment and get all this shit in the manuals that was right. wrong out. And, and we were actually able to do that. They, they were like, yeah, but it says in the manual. I said, the manual's wrong. This is ballistics. You know, let, let me show you in the ballistic engine how to figure this stuff out. So it, uh, a lot of that stuff, it was just common sense. Show it to them. Uh, same way with trim. So back to your question. To me, I'm going to lay down and get a quick zero. And then immediately I'm moving out to trans. So I, I, I can remember when uh, I first started running around with Brian Lance and, and we were talking about shooting into and through trans. And he said, Todd, you can't predict what's going to happen with transonic. And I said, yeah, you can, Brian. And he said, Todd, you can't. And he's, he's a rocket scientist. So it's, it's stupid <laughs> cowboy Todd arguing with a, with a true ballistician. And, and I told him, I said, I do it all the time. I just shoot through it. And if it, Wherever it hits, I just tell my computer that and make it flow back. Wow. That's so Todd, I want to ask this question too, because you talked about a quick zero. We've talked about accuracy. When it comes and when it comes to military, like I get precision rifle shooting is one thing. What is accurate to you when it comes to a combat zero or like the average person? Like obviously we can talk about precision, we want them as tight as possible, but in your opinion, what is accurate? To, to me, since I shot competition, shooting string long range, uh, when you're shooting, uh, you know, two miles away, uh, 2,000 meters away, uh, it gets back to precision in the first place. 
So it's, you know, you're, you're, you're having to be very precise. When you really bring that up, and Brian talks a lot about the difference between accuracy and precision, uh, to me, a accurate rifle is one that can do the job that you have for it. Uh, I can th- take a 300 blackout that shoots a two-inch group, and if I'm shooting at pigs at 150 yards away, it's accurate enough. It's not I ain't got to worry about it. Yeah. yeah, so it's not a problem. Uh, personally, I would not want to shoot one, uh, but I'm, I'm looking for more, more of a precise instrument that allows me to reach out farther. Uh, I want to be able for it to hit where I'm predicting. So back to the kind of the other question, once I zero a gun and get a good tight zero on it, then I'm going to go out and I'm going to shoot out to distance, transonic. If you do your job and you plug in the information correctly, there is, I mean, I've trained 9,000 guys uh, up to about two years ago, and my son has taken over all the training and does all the military training now. So up to two years ago, I had 9,000 guys under my belt. And not one person on the planet has ever came to my place, shot, true to rifle, and it was off anywhere. If it's off anywhere, you got user information plugged in incorrect. It just cannot hmm. not work. Yeah. How big are you? I'm a big guy. I'm a big guy with this little bitty, and you'd, you'd be amazed. I mean, I'm sure you're not amazed, but lots of people would be amazed of the little bitty add-ons that make such a big difference. I'm a big can't guy with a bubble level. Um, you know, at first it took a while to buy in because I was like, hey, is this just like, is this like a spoiler for your car? Is this like, oh, this just looks cool, <laughs> you know? And hey, yeah, that looks, oh, I look professional now. Yeah. And then I kind of got explained like, hey, you know, shooting, it, it all matters. So shooting close range, um, and when I mean close, you know, 200 meters and in, I mean, it does matter, but, you know. Well, basically, if you look at six degrees of camp, is going to be a tenth of a mil every mil of elevation home. So if you're holding right. six right. mils, you're going to be 0.6 off. And you're right. also going to be low. Well, two minutes yeah. of angle is nearly a miss on every target that you're shooting. But if you're looking across, especially in, in open terrain, it's really hard for the human eye to tell what is perfect level and what's can. And so a bubble level is huge. And, and it's one... And Pete Gould admitted, he said, we just didn't know. He said, I can't tell you how embarrassed I am that we failed so many men going through soda that probably most of them would have passed if we would have talked uh, bubble rubs. And so, yeah. And, and so with mine, the reason I created one, I wanted one with tritium in it because we fought at night. And so I said, hey, you know, uh, I want to build one that the military can use at night because back then, you know, we yelled at night. Not so much now, but uh, back then we did. And so it's like, if you're going to run at night, you need a trivial valve in the sense you can see it. Sure. And so in the design, it took about two years. Uh, I have a partner that's in my Accuracy First DG. That's a store. And I said, hey, find me a bubble level that we can make this thing on. Well, he looked for a year, and I called him up, and I said, hey, what the hell's taking so long? He said, Todd, man, you would not believe the tolerances in bubble levels. He said, there's a lot of bubble levels. You can turn it five degrees and the bubble never moves. And, and I knew from shooting archery, we always had bubble levels on archeries uh, or on, on bow yeah. setups. And so I, I'm sitting there and I can remember turning my bow and some of the cheap little bubbles that you might get from your local archery store that didn't cost anything. It might not move at all while you're moving this much, you know. So I was like, okay. I said, so what do we got to do? We got to build a custom unit? He said, yeah, I'm talking to a group to build us a custom unit. I was like, oh, my gosh. So it took nearly two years before we got the vials, but it had the ceramic ball in it because the air pockets or the little air bubbles don't move as accurately as that ceramic right. ball does. So mm. that, that was the reason we created it. And the tritium ball, well, then I got in trouble with the NRC. Nuclear, nuclear Regulatory Commission. <laughs> uh, they, they didn't want a cowboy from West Texas with fifty thousand dollars of tritium in his house. What? Uh, so <laughs> this is America. Well, no. Yeah, yeah. I, I thought it would be a problem, and actually, I had the highest level people, all the tier ones, FBI, Secret Service, everybody that I was training. They was like, "Hey, buddy, get it off his back. We need this stuff." You know, and they <laughs> they, they they finally gave in. They said, "Okay." Uh, he, he has to buy a license. It's fifteen thousand dollars a year. And I oh. said, I ain't going to make five thousand dollars off this stuff. So I said, no, nope, we ain't going to do it. So 
I talked to Ronnie Wright, and Ronnie made me the little slip-on uh, deal that we can turn on. So it's electric, gives the same capability. Uh, so we, we don't have to deal with tritium and all that. And therefore, while somebody may or may have not snuck something from Canada for us for a bit, but that was, <laughs> it, it, it all went to the military, and that was the only guys that got it. But, so but that that has been a big thing, you know, uh, as far as the advancement for the guys getting good bubble levels, uh, whether it's mine or the bubbles that are made out there. But it's it's something I would never. You know, I, I used to teach my kids when we go elk hunting to, to, to align their crosshairs with the aspen trees. So once you get on your elk, once you see him, you follow that vertical line straight with the aspen trees because God's going to make those trees grow straight to the sun. And, and most of the time, the, the, the trees in the woods that are running all together are straight up and up, at right least up. enough that you can utilize it uh, at the distances we were shooting, we wouldn't be off. Of so, Todd. Let's assume uh, a, a regular guy who doesn't know uh, doesn't know anything about shooting long range. But I've got a I've got a basic bolt rifle um, in a in a well known caliber, and you're gonna write the book Long Range for Dummies. What is a short list of the gear that this guy needs, along with that bolt action rifle, to start his adventure in long range shooting? Okay, and, and, and that's really easy for me. Thank goodness we have companies uh, that produce, and I'm going to go through several so you can take your pick. Uh, okay. I, I, used, I used to snub uh, Savage Rifles, and, and even a poor country kid, I, I thought a Savage Rifle was kind of like the really low end of the deal. I wanted to rim into the 700 ADL because that's all I could afford. Well, everybody does. Uh, yeah, <laughs> so it, it was, you know... The guys come on, uh, the military guys come on the range and they're like, hey, can I bring my personal rifle out tomorrow? And I'm like, sure, dude, it's your course. And so they would come out and they'd bring their Savage and they'd go, hey, you want to shoot my gun? I didn't want to shoot your gun. But, you know, being nice, I was like, yeah, yeah, man, I want to shoot your gun. So I'd jump on the gun. Guys, I got to admit, I've never shot a Savage that wasn't a shooter. Every one of them I've shot have been shooters. Yeah. And now I've shot a lot of them. So... I would no, never tell anybody not to buy a sandwich. Uh, good guys. Now, my grandpa the, used to say, uh, "A set you can get a nicer gun than a savage, but you'll never get a better gun than a savage." Yeah, I, I, I don't, I don't doubt that. So, uh, I, Franco Brenna, uh hired me and flew me into Finland to redesign the TRG forty two and turn it into the M ten. Well, when I get okay. to Finland, these guys walk me in this build at the Saco factory. And there's, you know, blue parts and silver parts. Uh, and it's like we walked in the back door somewhere in the factory. And, and they said, uh, you know, it, this is Sako, this is Tika. And I was like, okay, I get Sako. That's high end. That's awesome. What's Tika? I, I said, is that like gray or silver? And, and they said, no, it's Tika. Uh, I, I said, is that a different color? Because I wouldn't get it. And, and he said, come here. So we walked around the corner, big sign says Tika and all these Spanish guns. I was like, oh my gosh. I said, when did y'all buy Tika? He said, 1952. So I was like, I, I didn't even know what a Tika was. Guys, I've never shot a bad Tika. So if, if, no. if I had money wise, all right, so I, I have, hard to beat. Uh, guys, you, you can buy really, really good Tika for under a thousand dollars and you can yeah. get some of the tricked out stocks for 1200. So, I mean, you can buy, we'll get into optics in a minute. That'll be a whole other deal. You can buy a really good, high quality 6.5, 260. And the only reason I'm going to say right now, doing with the 6.5, six is because the ammo is more prevalent right now with a lot of companies. Mm -hmm. It's easier to get because the military went with it. Uh, but I will tell you one thing don't snub your 308 for training. When I go train, when Todd trains Todd, I shoot a 308. Wow. So, but to answer your question, I'd buy Tika because it's probably, I, 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 don't, I, mean, I hate to say cheapest. It's one of the most affordable. It's a good awesome, value. Awesome rifle. So I, I can remember buying them for $656. All right. And, yeah. and, and that, that was not good boy price. That was just a, a straight right. Tika. You know, and, and I have five surgeon rifles at home. And these Ooh. are the. Oh, surgeons pre, are nice. Yeah, they, these are the pre-sale surgeons. So this is when they were still in Prague, Oklahoma. 
guys, when people show up with tikas, I, I tell them, I ain't going to shoot you for pink slips because that tikka may not <laughs> shoot my surgeon. So, so to answer your question, first thing I'm going to do is get a tikka for price. Yep. If I if I want to upgrade it, I'll probably get a little root. And then the emirates, which I think the emirates probably the best rifle on the planet. But I would start with a Tika uh, or a Bagheera. Yeah, I mean, either one of them is fine. Uh, and then I would buy high-quality ammunition for it because I see so many people spend a lot of money on guns and scopes, and then they go to Walmart and buy whatever's on sale, and then they, they blame the, the gun manufacturer. <laughs> so, but Man. back, back to your question. Next thing I'm going to do is spend my most important money. I'm going to spend it on glass. So 100%, you get out of a weapon system whatever the glass can do. You can buy a, a, a proof $7,000 guaranteed sub half minute of angle gun and put a piece of crap scope on it for $500 and you've got a $500 setup. And you're going to enjoy it like a $500 setup because you're not going to be able to see like you would hope. You're probably not going to be able to remove all the parallax out. Uh, there's going to be other problems. Gun won't return to zero, won't dial correctly. If you go to the range, shoot 800 meters. What do you hold? Nine mils? Dial nine mils. If you don't hit him in the head again, your scope ain't cracked. So that $4,500 scope, when I got dialed 10 mils, it hit it 10.4. It was 0.4 mils off. It's useless to me. It's still setting in the safe today. What do I do? If I put it on anything, I don't never die. I only hold. So it's a mm -hmm. basically, a, a, I'd say a 10 mil scope and in. So I, I'd use it up to 10 mils, you know, good hunting scope. It's a great glass. It's high dollar glass. Uh, but it's, you know, it's not worth it. So I would spend my main, my main piece of my budget on glass. You, you really can't beat not force. Swarovski's are good scopes, but they're they're not military ready yet. They they will be. Uh, Steiner is another great scope. Uh, but but getting back to your question, you know, you're not going to be not force. Uh, they probably hold first, second, third place in scope one. Uh, you're not going to beat the durability. And everybody wants to talk about warranty. Uh, I've never seen a scope sent back to not force that wasn't warranty. So you, you can't go you know on the warranty side. You get what you pay for with the scope. Now, let's talk about not cheap scopes, quality scopes that are affordable. All right, guys, Horace has that new whatever it's called hover uh, scope or Raptor, whatever it is. Uh, it, it has the orange ring on the back. It's a five to twenty power. It has a trimmer five. It has a trimmer three. And guys, that is probably one of the most Overlooked scopes on the planet. So you can get them on sale sometimes for $1,200. And it, it has some of the best glass that you're going to shoot. So I keep one in my truck at all times. It's on a hunt route. And, and I use it all the time. I give it to guys when they go, how great that scope? Hey, put it on your offer. Go, go get zero and go shoot. The clips are awesome. It dials perfect. It has great glass. And it retails for $1,500. So I don't know... If if I was like really really I forgot the name of the company, uh, my son had a guy bring in a scope the other day. It's a five hundred dollars scope. I have to apologize. I can't remember the name of it. Uh, mm -hmm. Guys, we didn't find anything wrong with it other than for the price, you can't get a, a good reticle. So you you have to play with the crosshairs that are in it and dial. Uh, but for five hundred bucks, it's insane. But that's not the norm. That that's kind of a, a unicorn because you know. in in today's world, oh, yeah. you pay you pay two thousand dollars for shit scopes, yeah. uh, and, and they're everywhere. My deal is, I I go buy a Tika. Uh, next one up would be a Siete Larue. Next one up would be a Proof. If I just wanted to shoot long range, and you know, you still get a. a I don't think it's a, it's a Mark Twenty Two now. Uh, but you can still get the Barrett's for, you know, seven, eight grand yeah. used online on places. Uh, so, but that's, that's not a starter gun. The starter gun, I, I definitely just go buy a Tika. You're not going to beat it. And if you want to upgrade a little bit, get a Barrett, uh, uh, Siete. And then 
make sure you get good mounts. I see people go cheap on mounts, and guys, that's your interface between your optics and your gun. Yeah, yeah, you're definitely right. Um, looking at what you've got, man, uh, you know, I know that you pretty much stick with uh, the military train right now, but as far as accuracy first goes, it looks, you mentioned Pete earlier, Pete Gold, and it looks like the next, uh, I guess I'll go ahead and close out the end of the year uh, that I see. Um, Pete's got a few dates uh, at the Austin Gun Club uh, for anybody yep. interested. Uh, long range one and two, that's a three-day class. You've got those um, October 25th through 27th. And then the next one is long range two and advanced and that's a four-day class and that's uh november 14th through 17th and then uh december 5th through 8th is that right or close yeah no. yes uh and we're probably going to start doing some stuff me and kevin owens are probably going to start running around together and doing these little uh pr stock classes where we may end up flying to boise together and doing a class or you know uh, we, we may come to, to wherever, you know, we, we may run down to San Antonio and do a class or jump up to, you know, Orfino or wherever. It doesn't matter to us. we got to get on an airplane and fly somewhere. So, but we're, we're going to probably do, I love Kevin. We're close friends and uh, he's out doing his own stuff now. He stopped by and I said, hey, I've been trying to hire him forever. Uh, and now that Colby, my son, is taking over all the military classes uh, he's killing it. He's, I mean, he's started out in college aerospace engineering, so he can sit down and argue with Brian Licks about ballistics, and uh, he's super intelligent and does a great job training. Uh, actually, I used to go in and sit and listen to him so I could critique some of the stuff he was saying, and now before I have to go out and take a or if he's going to Italy or uh, Germany or wherever doing training, and I had to take a class, another military class that double booked. Uh, I'll go in and sit and listen to him for two weeks, two weeks, teach just so I can teach at his level. So I'm not cheating the guys. So he's, he's by far a better instructor than I ever was. Mm -hmm. Uh, but he's, he's killing it, doing a good job. But me and me and Kevin, we've talked about it. I think we're going to start bouncing around a little bit, playing and, uh, taking the class to the guys. Uh, right. and we'll probably do some of where they come to us, but, but bounce around a little bit more and make it more accessible for the guys so that they don't have to travel as much. Come up, come up, uh, come up my yeah. neck of the woods, come up to Nashville. Maybe you can do something at Barrett. I'm you in Boise, I know. San Antonio, I'm, I'm the earth of which, yeah, I'm yeah, right by you, so. Yeah, there you go. I'll be in San Antonio, what, uh, end of October. Oh, so, there we uh, go. Yeah, now I've started, uh, past three three and a half years heavy into sporting clubs. So Nationals mm. is in San Antonio, and I'll be there for that. Of course so it is. It's, it's, anything competitive yeah. with a gun or anything competitive, there's it's all, all right here. Slingshot, yeah. the next thing. I mean, you're Slingshots, in. yeah. Uh, yeah, and so I, I got stupid with shotgun. So I, I, I told my shooting partner, uh, I said, dude, I am not spending $9,000 on a shotgun. And so at the time, we had uh, $3,500, 682 gold in Berettas, which were phenomenal. Uh, yeah. But ended up buying an ASC Beretta, which was 7000 So I was right. I didn't spend 9000 and And then I bought a Corazzi for twelve and a half. I was about to say, so, you, didn't spend, you didn't spend nine. Yeah, I didn't well. spend nine. But, and, then, and then we buy shotgun shells by the pallet and six pallets at a time. So Ooh. that's 7000 then. Now it's like $8,000 a pallet. Yeah. So it's it's an expensive sport, uh, pro probably a little <laughs> bit more than, than the rifle <laughs> world was. But it, it's something that's totally different. So I shot pistols, one nationals with pistols, shot rifle, won a lot of competition there, shot shotgun all my life, bird hunting, but had never shot clay pigeons. And it has totally consumed me. So doing what I do there uh, in the rifle world have now jumped over to the shotgun world. So I, I figured out formulas for, for, for moving clay pigeon targets to where you can take the range and subtract two, just like if it's 50 yards. Here you go. Uh, it's now he's three. Get a whiz wheel right. for, he's, he's coming out with a whiz wheel. Yeah. Whiz wheel for sporting yeah. clays. 
it, it, that may be something I actually try. Are you? Yeah, we here we go. go. So are you? Are you yeah. that guy walking around at Sporting Clays, and are you walking station to station, or are you? Are you riding on that on that side by side with all the guns mounted on the rack and just? You got the golf cart. <laughs> Yeah, I'm right. Hell yeah. yeah. So we, I'm right. We, yeah, we, we, we haul a Can-Am Defender everywhere we go. Oh, so man. Now, we're, we're, not, we're not like the guys that are tricked out that have the air conditioner rig with the four-gun gun rack in the back. Oh, yeah. With the welding umbrella on top of that. Uh, we're, we're more redneck. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, it, it gets us around. That's awesome, man. That's awesome. That's super cool. Todd, we're about out of time today, but, man, we appreciate it. You have given us – some amazing stories. I, we, I actually want to welcome you back on the show because I think you have a ton more to give us. But before we get out of here today, where can they find you? Where can they find Accuracy First? All right, so accuracyfirst.com is our website. That will give you not only the, uh, uh, the training stuff, uh, but, but it'll give you the, the, the product. So it's, it's Accuracy First DG is that side. But accuracyfirst.com, uh, you can go there. You can find me at Todd at accuracyfirst.com. And guys, I, please do not waste your money. It, you know, we talked a lot about optics and guns. If you call me and ask, I'm going to be bluntly honest. And I'll, I'll say yeah. stuff that I, I won't say, you know, here on the Internet. But, but I'll tell you, hey, don't buy this piece of shit. Yes. You're wasting your money. And so, but, and, and, and we we need to hear me. that sometimes, though. Yeah. Well, I get guys call me all the time. like, hey, Todd, you don't know me. I got your number from so-and-so uh, or found it on the Internet. I'm fixing to spend a lot of money, and if you got five minutes, which turns into usually 45 minutes, oh, yeah. uh, they, they just want to ask a couple of questions, and I'm like, stop. Don't, don't even apologize. I, do, I want to see you continue in the sport, be part of it, uh, enjoy long-range shooting, and, and not get flustered because you bought all the wrong equipment. You go out, and you start competing, and then you figure out, well, I bought the wrong crap. Now I got to sell it, and I'm only going to get you know two thirds of it back. And now I've got to go buy more expensive gear, and it may not be more expensive gear. It may be just that you spent the your wrong money on the wrong caliber, the, money the wrong money. optic. Yeah. So I, I tell people all the time: send me an email, give me a uh, give me a holler on the phone, I'll answer it. So I answer phone calls that I don't know the number all the time. So in 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 we crack we do this. I, I got a phone call the other morning. Uh, as, not quite six o'clock. It's like five fifty in the morning. He, he was probably on the east coast. He called me up, and I got you know got up. I was actually working out and got up off the ground and answered the phone call. And I was like, "What the hell? Who's calling me at five fifty? And he's like, "Hey, you got a minute to answer some questions on a gun purchase?" I'm like, "Sure. What do you do?" So and talked him out of buying the three thirty eight and then the three hundred win man. So nice. But yeah, absolutely. Love to join y'all anytime. Uh, yeah, we can we can talk a lot yeah, and, about ballistics. And I want to stay in touch because once you get this road show going, man, I mean, I'd love to go down there and take a class. But you know, yeah, once, yeah. once you get this hammered out and we know where you're going, I do want to know because uh, I want to get out there and you know, I want to I want to learn. Well, I, 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 I still love teaching. Uh, you know, Kobe's got the military, and when I need to, I help him out there. Uh, and usually, when I say help him. Uh, it's when he's gone overseas and we went to Italy together last year for training a group. So it was funny. Uh, it cut me off before we were running out of time, but, uh, the, the Italy group, when we came in, they was like, Hey Todd, uh, you know, we, we can only afford one instructor, one flight. So I'll pay my own flight. Kobe's doing the instruction. Uh, but, but I'll come. So if you got a question, I'll answer the question. So we get over there and they're, they're very strict about wanting me to do the instruction. And I said, you listen to Kobe and tell me you understand everything he's saying. And, and I said, he, he'll do a better class for you. And they said, well, we already know this, this, and this, and we go down the list. And, and I was like, all right. So we go through it. Well, the next morning, that guy pulled me aside. And he said, hey, we're, we're good with Kobe to come back by himself. And so, <laughs> so, so Kobe's phenomenal. He's doing a good job. Uh, but, yeah, I'm, I, I still miss doing a lot of instruction. Uh, I do. I do a lot of it. Just me and some friends get along together. And, you know, go out and do some shooting. That, but I, I still, I still love hanging out with the guys and and shooting and having a beer at the end of the day, swapping stories. And yeah, it's still that's something I, I love. So that's what I need. I need out there shooting and you throwing rocks behind me at me, telling me all the shit I'm doing. <laughs> that, that's what we need. I, 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 
Yeah, I actually am good at that. So but yeah, yeah, I, I, I may be in Boise. Well, I was going to be there next Monday, uh, but I think we're canceling that trip due to the fires and the heat. Still, it's so to there, bad. Yeah, it's I was so bad to be there right now. A month ago, and it was 110 in Boise and 108 in Orofino. So we canceled yep. that, and so I, I was supposed to uh, fly up Monday for two weeks. And I just got a phone call. We need to cancel that. So now I'm looking at maybe third week of October, trying to come okay. up. So I'll holler at you and uh, try to figure out maybe we can uh, get on a range together. Or you're in Boise. I'm in Boise uh, myself. All right, um, cool. Well, hi, yeah, get, that would me, be six. Six. Send me your contact, and we can at least go out. I, I'd love to come out and embarrass myself. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Yeah, I'd love to go. come be embarrassed. Oh, no problem <laughs> yeah. at all. Yeah, absolutely. And and like I say, uh, I you know we can meet up in San Antonio and do classes. Nashville. Yeah. I, I work it. with I work with Barrett anyway, so you know I need to go out there and harass him so we can come into Nashville, eat some barbecue, and have a good time. Let's do it, and we'll go find Chris Barrett, and we'll just talk about all his sports cars and. <laughs> go, te- go tear up his bar. Yeah, go tear up his bar and talk about all his ugly hats. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> awesome. Well, Ty, I can't thank you enough for coming on the show. For real. You are always welcome back. You are a friend of the show, and we will talk to you soon. Yeah, give me a holler. I'd be happy to do it anytime, guys. All right. Thanks, Ty. Take care. All right. All right, guys. Big thank you to everyone that made it this far on the podcast. All four of you, we appreciate it. Todd, thank you once again for coming on the podcast. Wealth of knowledge. I think we could have talked for two more hours, which I think we will have him back on because there's so much more this man can teach us. Mike, Matt, what are your closing statements? Um, I'm, I'm still trying to, uh, to, to process everything because it was a wealth of knowledge and it, it's partially intimidating because some of the things I have to like really think about and go back and say, what did he say again? And like, do I really understand this? But that's also in that same reason it makes me want to really like meet him in person and share mm-hmm. with him and say, what do you really mean like this? Like, yeah, you said third grade math. Let's go to second now. Teach me. Yeah. So. <laughs> Teach him Tennessee math. Yeah. I, uh, I, I, he's obviously just an encyclopedia of shooting knowledge, uh, walking, talking encyclopedia of shooting knowledge. So I, I might genuinely take him up on that invite when he comes to Boise at least to go by and shake hands with the guy. Um, anybody who's that passionate about what it is that they do, like I could, I could learn a lot from. And so if I could even get a, a, a percentage of, of that knowledge, uh, man, I'd, I'd probably be 10 times the shooter. Hell yeah. yeah what do you yeah. think, Adam? Um, man, I was just blown away with the math. He's like, this is simple math. I'm like, it is simple, but to get to that simplicity, you had to understand a lot of complex aspects to it. So Kudos mm-hmm. to him, uh, to what he's doing for the military. I mean, it's just amazing. So, um, guys, this has been a great show. Once again, if you are not subscribed to Whiskey and Windage, Whiskey and Windage, we're not doing this again. Um, you won't bells. because it's already too late and you've exactly. already hit the X button. But if yeah. you're still here, Mom. <laughs> yes. Yes, Mom, if you're still here, subscribe, notifications, leave a comment. If it's a negative comment, that's cool. We're all about it. I love it. Guys, like I always say, stay dangerous, carry a weapon. We'll talk to you soon.